walked up two miles. We don't spit them out, they come off on their own. All right, at this time we're back in session. We'll go to uh, uh, Commissioner Bledsoe with the Wildlife Committee. Thank you, Chairman Brown. The Wildlife Committee would like to recognize Bill Reeves to discuss the white nose syndrome in bats. Back this summer, when we had the commission uh, orientation, part of my presentation uh, dealt with uh, the plight that bats currently have with white nose syndrome and that they're being killed off by the millions, particularly in the eastern United States from this fungus infection that they get. And a few weeks ago, CBS News ran a segment on the evening news about the artificial bat cave that the Nature Conservancy has constructed in Montgomery County in part to address aspects of white nose syndrome. So I thought what a great opportunity to bring this information to you on the commission about what we're doing locally or what TNC has started locally and we're a partner in uh, with to address this particular thing. So we've got that segment to show you after the segment, some of the, our partners with TNC are here, so I'd like to introduce them and let them say a word to you as well. So if I can figure out how to get out of this, out of the, out of the crack here. I think I've got it now if I can just see. Elk, elk, bill cave, okay. That do good this up? is one of the entrances to the Bellamy Cave system. Corey Holliday of the Nature Conservancy took us to a Tennessee cave that's the winter home to 160,000 endangered gray bats that could be extinct within a decade from white nose syndrome. This is a wildlife disease. It's unprecedented in, in our history. Scientists are still mystified by this fungus, which shows up as a white powdery residue and disturbs the bat's natural sleeping pattern basically causes bats to use up their energy that they've stored to get them through the winter. They come out of hibernation early before there's any food available and while it's still very cold and they don't make it through the winter. White Nose was first discovered in four caves in New York back in 2006. Now it's in 19 states and moving further west every year. Researchers are doing everything from tagging bats to understand migration patterns to a project at Bucknell University in Pennsylvania where 200 bats have been intentionally infected with the fungus to try to develop a possible treatment. We've never seen a disease like this. Ann Froschauer is with U.S. Fish and Wildlife, which coordinates the patchwork of research programs. How is it to go into one of these caves where you've seen a, a huge die-off of bats. Yeah, it's uh, it's pretty grim. You're looking in and it looks like a carpet of pine needles on the floor of the cave, except for that you know it's not pine needles, it's all bones. Yeah, we're going to close it off. We've got double doors. Corey Holliday and the Nature Conservancy are so concerned about the Tennessee gray bat that they're taking a dramatic $300,000 gamble, building a first-of-its-kind man-made bat cave. The bats will come, hibernate in the wintertime, after they leave in the spring, we can go in and clean the fungus out of the artificial cave. Scientists hope by keeping the cave clean, they'll be able to slow the spread of the disease. How many bats do you hope will hibernate in here? Well, eventually, we could easily sustain 10 to 20,000. There's enough surface area, really, for 200,000. If it works, other artificial caves could be built elsewhere which might help save hundreds of thousands of America's most endangered bats. Seth Doan, CBS News, Stewart County, Tennessee. So, Corey is here today, but I probably ought to introduce his boss first. 
uh, Gina Hancock, the uh, state director for the Tennessee chapter of the Nature Conservancy. Gina, yeah. <laughs> and Commissioner Woodson, you may have seen her camped out down in the halls of the legislature because I think that's where she spends her entire spring. Um, but Corey, if you would like to uh, come up and uh, address any issues that you would uh, like to say or uh, have the commission answer any commission uh, questions the commission may have sure I'd, I'd like to just make a few comments if that's all right before we go to questions um, i did want to also point out just real quickly that both projects mentioned in that little video the bucknell university research project of inoculating bats and the and the artificial cave of course twra was involved in um, and I, I'll keep it brief. I know you guys have a long schedule today, but I, I kind of just wanted to make three pretty quick points. The first is, is just uh, to say thank you so much to TWRA for being a partner in this project. Um, TWRA has been um, by our side start to finish on this, uh, from the conception of what to do and how to, how to combat white nose syndrome and, and coming up with ideas and, and artificial cave was one of those concepts. Um, all the way through uh, construction and, and into implementation and research going going forward in the future. Uh, TWRA has been a great a great advocate of the project and just a great partner to have and, and we're very very thankful. Um, I know some of the folks in this room have spent a lot of time uh, on this project, Dwight, Josh, uh, Richard, a lot of hours getting this done because it's such a big issue and that's sort of my second point is how important white nose syndrome is and, and the bats of Tennessee are. There are millions of bats in Tennessee. About half of them are likely to be susceptible to this disease. We have bats that occur here in the southeast uh, that live nowhere else in the world. Um, and they're vulnerable to this disease. Um, you know, potential that they could go extinct in a number of years. And this project is the first project to really look at saving meaningful numbers of bats and, and prove prove the concept of artificial habitats uh, to mitigate and offset the effects of white nose syndrome. And if it's successful, we can build these, a lot of these things, they'll be, um, they'll be open for public funding. This was all built with private funding because there is risk involved. Um, but once we prove the concept and, and show, if we're successful, if we show that these artificial caves and artificial habitats can be used to keep bats safe from, from white nose syndrome, I think it'll take off and it'll be really, really meaningful to the bats, not just in Tennessee, but in North America. Um, and my third, just quick thing I wanted to say is, while I've got your attention, something that I'm sure you all already know, and that's just how great your non-game staff is. I've been in Tennessee working for about eight and a half years, and I think the non-game people here are the highest quality, highest caliber folks I've worked with anywhere. Um, and I'm just very, honored to be able to work with them day to day. And I'm happy to take any questions you have about the project. Are all bats susceptible to this point? No, as far as we know, it's only cave hibernating bats. Um, and in Tennessee, we have about 16 species of bats. About half of those are cave hibernators. And those are really the, the bats that we know the most about, although it's still very little. Bats are small, they fly at night, uh, they're out on the landscape. In general, we don't know that much about them. Uh, the cave hibernators, because they congregate in these caves in the wintertime, we can go in and, and at least count them and, and census them and try to get a handle on how many we have. Um, but how, do you, how did you, what started it? I mean, what, what was the... The disease? Yeah. It's, it's an introduced fungus. Um, so it's a fungus that was brought to North America from somewhere else. And it, it's like any other exotic invasive, you know, the native the native inhabitants of these caves have no um, no natural defense to it. Um, not that we know of, no, not at all. Uh, how do you attract the bats to the artificial habitat? Well, bats are pretty good at finding finding their own sites. They are used to these changing ephemeral habitats. You know, trees they roost in trees a lot, and their con forests are constantly changing. Caves even are constantly changing, where sinkholes fill in and cave entrances change to some extent. So they're always out seeking new habitats, and artificial habitats like bat houses and, and things of that nature generally do very well, but the occupancy rate is, is or colonization time is a little bit slow. It's you know anywhere from three to seven years 
Um, and, and with this project, one of the reasons we built it on TWRA is Bellamy Cave Preserve is we built it between two entrances of a cave that has 160,000 bats in the wintertime. So we're hopeful that they'll find it pretty quickly. And we are broadcasting uh, ultrasonic bat calls from the entrance of the cave. Um, and that's experimental still. And we did that a little bit this year and we're hopeful to do it a lot more next year when the bats, during their more active season. Is this cave half closed to completion or is it? Closed? It is complete. The construction, uh, our goal was to have it done by September um, so that the bats coming in to hibernate this year, it, it would be there just in case any of them wanted to check it out. And we had it in place. Um, all of our research and monitoring equipment is not completed and installed yet, but the cave is there. Yep. Do you do anything in particular to the inside of the cave surface-wise that makes it more tractable? Yeah. Uh, we've, we've tried to rough in or texture just about every surface in the cave just to give them something to hold on to. Um, and that was done both during the concrete pouring process through molds and then where we couldn't do that, we went in and applied um, just sort of mesh, and we're experimenting with different sizes of mesh to see if they have preferences. Um, just sort of par for the course when you're doing a project that's experimental and never been done before. How long will it, will it be before you have the data that says yeah. we're making it then this? Or? Honestly, at least three years. Uh, when we see White Nose Center tends to follow about a three year scenario. Uh, the first year you'll see it in a cave. And it's not till the third year at a, at a given site that you typically have large mortality events. And the average mortality at a given cave is above 90% for the bats in that cave. That's right. Um, and and that's, that's what we're trying to fight. How is the inoculation working out? Well, I, I'm not directly involved with that study. Uh, what I hear is their preliminary results are positive, um, but that, that as a mitigation strategy has a lot of limits because you have you know to apply that in in the field practically would be very challenging because you have to apply it to individual bats um, right now can you do anything in the caves where you find it to treat the fungus not that we know of right now everything that we have at our disposal now that we know um, is, is able to control and limit the growth of the fungus would also wipe out everything else in the cave. Uh, caves have really incredible ecological systems and because there's no sunlight, no plant life, they're based on microorganisms, bacteria and fungi. And because this is a fungal pathogen, um, everything that controls this fungus would, would sort of wipe out the other cave ecology. Having trouble, could bats get in your ear? <laughs> <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> Not yet. Thank you, Corey. Uh, we really appreciate all you're doing, and uh, I live up on the Cumberland Plateau, and we, we're blessed with caves. So we sure are. We, we really appreciate it. Uh, any other questions from the commission? Gina, did you have anything to add? Yeah. Thank you so much for yep. the Thank you. All right, next we'd like to recognize, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, <laughs> I was Keep just going to mention, we not only work with TNC on on this project but one of the big areas that we're partners on is land acquisition because uh, as you know from being on the commission we don't have easy access to a lot of big dollars all at one time but they're flush with money so <laughs> so they'll go out if we, on a mutually agreeable project they'll go out and buy the land and then we'll pay them back uh, over a long period of time um, and they sell it to us at a bargain basement price, so it's a, it's a joint effort in that. Uh, they've worked with us on the uh, habitat conservation plans mm -hmm. on the Cumberland Plateau for the forestry plan. Uh, they're basically the lead agency on the water resources plan. And they were also instrumental in us getting our state wildlife action plan or swap completed and their already partnering with us on the revision of that plan. So this is like a hand in glove operation with them. And I just want to stress that we are a nonprofit. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I'll take that, that was an inside joke. Um, also, 
from our, Corey mentioned our staff, Josh Campbell is here and he's a wildlife diversity coordinator, uh, biologist in region two or coordinator two. Um, and Brian Flock is here, he's our central office uh, herp and small mammal guy that kind of works through the bat stuff from the central office. So uh, now you know more about bats than you knew before. Next, the Wildlife Committee would like to recognize Chuck Yost, wildlife biologist, deer program coordinator. <clears throat> Talk about the chronic wasting disease importation ban. Thank you very much, commissioners. I actually have several topics for you today, but uh, Jim Hamilton said I only have five minutes, so I'll be I'll be brief. No I was asked today by Chief Ratajak to speak to you guys and bring you up to speed on how the fall turkey season went and then also give you an update on how the uh, white-tailed deer season is going and then finally to talk about the CWD importation restrictions that we have. Now in regards to the fall turkey season, there's not a whole lot to be said uh, other than the, the results from the harvest. But we did, we did have our season back in October, from October 13th through the 26th. Now this is the shotgun hunt that's the most popular hunt, but also keep in mind that, that archers during the archery only deer season are also able to harvest turkeys during that time. And something new for this year was this, that the counties that have a fall turkey season, uh, the archers in those counties could actually tag all of their birds during that archery season. Uh, which, th if I'm not mistaken, this is the first year they've been able to do that. So, for instance, if there was a six county uh, or a six turkey limit in your county, you could have harvested all of those during archery season and not just within the, the shotgun hunt. Now, the, the harvest that we, that we had was nearly identical to 2011. Here's a graphic that will show you the results of that. Uh, just because the numbers are so small on the on the bottom what you've got is the year I've got I've got data there from 1998 through 2012 and obviously 2012 is the furthest to your right so as you can see we had a we had a high harvest uh, compared to uh, or since the initiation of this hunt so everything's good it looks like it was a real successful season and um, looks like we topped out at about 2,700 birds for that season. Now this is simply there just to remind me to change subjects, and because believe it or not, that's all there was to say about the fall turkey hunt. <laughs> Are there any questions about it specifically before I move forward? Okay to go? Okay, so with that in mind, as far as the, uh, the deer harvest, just like the fall turkey season, it's, it's been excellent. We're, um, if you look at the 2012 column there, the harvest is really high or higher than usual, a tad bit higher. Uh, now keep in mind this data, I'm, I'm, I made sure I compared apples to apples, and this data is from the beginning of archer season until today. So this does not include the dates say from today through January 6th. So that's what we're seeing when you compare with the previous years. Everything's looking good. Now I wanted to talk specifically about the muzzleloader season because it's come and gone and it's one of our most popular hunts. So it, it doesn't hurt to look at it since it's finalized and see how we did there. And things look real good there. Uh, it was really good harvest. Looks like we were around 4,200 and uh, if any of you guys had a chance to hunt during that time, you probably know this was excellent time to hunt. I hope you got, had a chance to get out there because it was, I saw a lot of good results from, from those two weeks. So that's what we saw as far as the muzzleloader hunt. Chuck. Yes, sir. You said 4,200. You mean 42,000? That's right. I, I apologize. Thank you very much. That's exactly right. So we were around 42,000. Know the difference, I mean, the buck 
I, you know, I didn't pay, I didn't look at that figure, but um, did you notice that, Daryl? Okay. So we would we would expect about fifty to fifty. Do you have it um, as far as districts, as far as the harvest, as far as what districts were stronger than others, or uh, who had more or less, et cetera, et cetera? Well, uh, yes, we do have that information. I, I don't have it prepared for this meeting, but with we'd be glad to share that with you. That what's that? Everybody keeps coming back telling me there's no deer in the woods in my neighborhood. <laughs> well. <laughs> but anyway, I'll, I'll move forward with that. <laughs> um, what I thought I would do, since um, since we've already got some preliminary data, our, our our folks have worked really hard, and they've gone out during the opening weekends of muzzleloader and the uh, big, big gun season and, and collected biological data at check stations and meat lockers. So we've actually already got some preliminary data that shows the age of the deer that, that are being harvested. So I thought I'd share that <coughs> with you. Now specifically these, these graphics that I'm gonna show you are for bucks. This is buck age data from this deer season. And just keep in mind it's preliminary and that we'll have some more results as time goes on. So I wanted to share this with you, and we're seeing we're seeing good things because what this graphic is this is the this is again the age of bucks, and it looks like that 42 percent of what has been harvested has been of the one and a half year old age class of bucks, and then we're seeing a 38 percent for two and a half, and 20 percent for three and a half and older. So this is the this is the kind of data. Um, <coughs> Well, this is just a reflection of what hunters are doing. They're be, being selected on what they're harvesting. And um, that's a real good result when you've got 20% of your harvest are three and a half or better. And I should, what I wanna do is show you some more or compare this to other states. And the information that I'm fixing to share with you was published in the 2011 Quality Deer Management Association's annual report. So the following information came from that report where this data is actually collected by our personnel in the field. And if you look at this for a comparison, you see it's nearly identical in uh, Kentucky as far as their age structure of what they're harvesting. And there's Indiana, which is the same. If you look at Ohio, you see some difference there, and it turns out that they're actually harvesting a few more of the year and a half age class than we are. And then Wisconsin is very similar to Ohio. So if you look at that for comparison, the age structure that we're harvesting is, if not identical, similar to these other states. And uh, if you pay much attention to, to, the, to the deer world, you know that these are the states that a lot of people um, look to for larger bucks. So these are your big buck states and it looks like we're comparing or we are very similar to what they're harvesting. Now while, while, while our folks have been out collecting this data, um, there's, uh, there's been some pictures that I have seen and people have shared with me and I just want to share a quick few of those with you to just give you an idea of, of um, the success that's happening. For example, this is in, in Wilson County, and these, they're just some real good stories, but this is a father and son, and that was actually the son's first deer. So you could imagine just how thrilled they are with, with that experience, and um, that, was, that was really neat to visit with them and hear that story. Now this deer has really got people's attention. This is a Fentress County deer that was killed during, during muzzleloader, and um, it's thought that this may be the new Tennessee muzzleloader record or the largest muzzleloader kill on, on record. So that's still yet to be determined, but that's obviously a very impressive animal. Where's Fentress County? Fentress County. That's where I live. Well, that didn't tell me anything. What's come, <laughs> come on. I don't know where you live. Two hours east of here. Okay. And that deer actually come about two miles from where my farm is. 
Yeah. You fed him, you fed him well. It tastes like chicken. How old is that? Did they age that deer? I, I haven't actually seen this deer in person, and I'm not. If there's a, if somebody aged it, I'm not sure. I haven't heard that information. But but I'm confident after today that the hunting leases just went up in Ventures County. So I apologize for that. <clears throat> this is a real good example of a WMA deer. I thought that was pretty special. I saw this. It came from Old Hickory WMA, and then also this came from North Chickamauga. I can barely say that, but. That's pretty, pretty great deer. Good job, uh, Rutherford County. Now this one's extra special. This is from Moore County, and this this happens to be Daryl Radjack's son. So that's a good that's a good example of uh, the memories that everybody here are helping to create. This is real impressive deer from Washington County. Now I want to make this clear that that is not a agency employee. <laughs> <laughs> that that is using the state truck the way you should. No, that's not the case at all. Um, this was a friend of a of a uh, wildlife officer, and once this guy killed this deer, he was so excited he called the wildlife officer, and the wildlife officer was nearby and was able to stop and document this trophy. That's r real impressive. And if you don't know where Washington County is, that's Johnson City, so that's the area that deer came from. So now. Um, this is this is pretty big news here, but uh, the new state record here, you'll notice that. <laughs> For some reason, I can't get anybody else on board with this. But. Well, we'll do a resolution right now. <laughs> I second that motion. Okay, pardon me for that. <laughs> So that's two out of three. Next, we're going to jump to the chronic wasting disease uh, restrictions. And this is more on the business side, so that I'll, I'll ask that you take action on this when I'm finished. <coughs> that, that just, just so you know, this photograph is some of our personnel out collecting CWD samples. That's been going on lately, too. So that's a good example of that. But what's taken place recently is back in October, they've discovered quite chronic wasting disease in Pennsylvania, and that was in Allen County. Um, so that's, that's noteworthy, and we'll talk about that some more, but something else that we've discovered is back in 2010 that New York has actually lifted their containment zone. They established a containment zone of two counties back when they discovered chron chronic wasting disease back in the 2005, but they've done approximately 30,000 uh, tests since then, uh, chronic waste and disease test, and have determined that it's no longer in the state. So they've actually lifted their containment zone. So I thought that was relevant for us to address today. So what the agency would like to, uh, to do is to expand the restriction zone to include Adams and York counties in Pennsylvania. Now the reason there's two counties instead of one is that's the actual containment zone that Pennsylvania has established for themselves. So we recommend that we expand to include those. Uh, however, we would like to remove the statewide ban for New York, uh, but we, we did feel like it was important to keep the two um, counties that they originally had as their containment zone. Now, if you guys were to act on this and approve this, this is the information that would be available on our website. And if you look to the far right to the map there, you, you'll, you'll notice New York and Pennsylvania, and those, those are the, the highest and to the right there. Those are the counties that, that are in yellow that this would affect. So with that in mind, the agency requests that the Wildlife Cu Committee expand the CWD restrictive zones to include Adams and York counties in Pennsylvania and to reduce the uh, restrictions in, in New York to only include Madison and Oneida counties. Okay, recommend, recommendation's been made. Do I hear a motion to update the chronic waste and disease importation ban? Got a motion, do I make a second? Second. 
All in favor say aye. Aye. Mr. Chairman, the Wildlife Committee voted and approved the updated chronic wasting disease importation ban. Thank you, Chuck. Uh, Thank you. Has anybody got any more questions for Chuck on the commission? Did you look at the age, uh, the kill from 2008, 9, 10, 11? Is it, is, is it changing or is it about the same as far as the it's it's the same it's it's interesting because um when I, whenever daryl and i looked at the results from this year we had that 20 percent in our mind of it you know uh, we, we we like the fact that we have 20 percent that are three and a half or older so we go we we started looking at this data with that number in mind sure enough that was the number and that number that 20 percent is based on those previous years that you're describing so yes that seems to be a consistent percentage that is incredible I'm just blown away by that are we Well, you know, it's it hadn't been but just a just a couple of months ago since I was up here talking about adding other states, so it's it's certainly a, a growing issue. Um, you know, it, just with the increased interest in moving animals for whatever purposes, that's when you start seeing increase in the potential of this disease. So, I would say that you know it, it's 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 being discovered regularly in new areas which is not a good pattern uh, however for Tennessee you know because of the restrictions that we have on the possession of white-tailed deer and such uh, that's really helped us or well, that's that's kept us from finding and or from having and um, in addition the sampling that we're doing each year uh, is a good thing to monitor and make sure that we don't have it and then these restrictions that we're um, that we're talking about today are all really good tools to help us stay ahead of it. Is it more prevalent where the deer density, the <clears throat> population density is greater? If it is, I haven't, I haven't read that. I haven't seen that documentation, but it seems to be more prevalent um, in areas with high concentrations of deer farming. And this, this case in Pennsylvania that was discovered was at a deer farm. I'm not sure of that number, Daryl. Do you have an idea? I apologize. I, I, I'll find out for you. I saw a, uh, a 30 minute show on the Outdoor Channel about CWD, and they said that there was now a test other than the, the brain test that you could test deer for CWD. Is that true? I have not heard that. There's not a uh, there's not a test a live test. That's right, a live. They, but they said there was a live test for deer. So I'm not familiar with that. Okay. The the only test that I'm aware of is is a is a fatal right. result. Uh, something something to to note: the USDA has actually added a a new uh, species of deer that can be affected by CWD. Now the species of that deer escapes me. Do we? Re you remember what that was? Sika deer. Sika deer. Hmm. So th that's of interest. That, you know, that's one thing that um, that's scary about chronic waste, wasting diseases. We know so little about it. So it's interesting that they've just added this new species, and that's just a result of us still learning about this disease. Yeah, that's exactly right. And there, there, there are those in high fenced areas or farmed. Have, are we seeing a trend that that maybe we're killing more deer that three and a half year olds because we're, our seasons are more liberal with does and all that people are starting to, as far as killing deer for meat, killing the, shooting the does and and maybe letting some of these other bucks walk. I mean, do y'all think that's a, a factor, or, or is our deer herd just getting healthier? 
some some of both i i think the i think it's restraint by the hunters uh i you know that's the inter interesting thing about tennessee deer regulations is there's there's just so much opportunity you know a three buck limit is a large buck limit as compared to some states so there's a lot of opportunity there but that doesn't it that doesn't seem to to motivate people to make sure that they kill three uh, they're out there and they're being very selective and you know they may go all year before they pull the trigger on one or they may keep themselves to two uh, and that I think that's the sort of thing that that helps just educating the hunter on on accomplishing that without forcing them to by you know certain regulations <clears throat> thank you Chuck any more questions from the Commission any questions from the audience thank, thank you, you. The Wildlife Committee would now like to recognize Darrell Radjack, Chief of Wildlife, to update us on the elk survey. Thank you, Commissioner. I'm, I'm not on the agenda, but I wanted to come up here and remind all the commissioners about three weeks ago, I sent out a, an email invitation to all the commissioners to join us um, on our annual elk survey. Uh, the, the folks out at North Cumberland Wildlife Management Area do a ton of work and, and Chuck mentioned some of the work that we do with the white-tailed deer and some of the turkey stuff we also do it with the elk and the elk surveys are taking place we have a big event scheduled um, for next Tuesday on the 4th uh, anyone that is is able to attend that you're welcome to do that I understand some of the uh, some of the commissioners may have uh, better luck on a weekend so we have scheduled for December 15th as well we will gladly coordinate uh, a, a trip out there for the commissioners to hopefully see some elk and we'll demonstrate how we do the elk surveys and all the work that goes into uh, gathering the data that we use to to make our recommendations to the commission so if any of the commissioners are interested i'll stick around afterward and we'll get a head count and we'll we'll coordinate that that trip for the commissioners thank you thank you darrell uh wildlife committee would now like to recognize David McKinney, Chief of Environmental Services, updates on the Cumberland Cove. Technical assistance again here. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, Committee, Chairman, Commissioners, I'm Another informational item to bring bring you all up to up to date on an issue you will be hearing about if you haven't already, and that is uh, the Cummings Cove Wildlife Management Area, uh, more commonly known as the Etna Mountain Area. This WMA um, is on the border of Marion and Hamilton counties. is down in Judge Brown's uh, territory and and has become something of a of an issue over the last last couple of years there are roughly 1200 acres maybe a little less than than that uh, that are uh, that the agency uh, owns and manages and this 1200 acres is transected by a kind of a wishbone pattern of uh, tva high voltage lines that go over the top of the mountain You'll see the Tennessee River off to the off to the north in this picture, and the river is flowing in a westerly direction, away away and up to the northwest of the slide. Um, we have um, a, a variety of adjacent landowners, in, including some large developments, the Tennessee River uh, Gorge Trust, and um, uh, several private private holdings along with uh, off to the south a, a land holding company from Colorado uh, these lands came to the agency under a program called forest legacy wherein the US Forest Service identified uh, tracts of land and partnered with the states to uh, try to manage large tracts of lands or restore them for for forest habitat and and turn them into a WMA the agency has done very little active management here because the access is so limited and it is that limited access that has um, uh, 
partially resulted in the in the issues we're dealing up there with now. That previous slide, um, the WMA and Caddy Corner to Caddy Corner is probably about two miles across. And under all of TVA's power lines, years of use by off-road vehicles and and ATVs have resulted in some some very serious erosion erosion issues. Uh, this area attracts um, off-road vehicle enthusiasts from uh, multiple state area. A lot of folks come up here from Georgia and Alabama. Um, you can virtually everywhere the the power lines go. You'll see these large. Uh, right of ways of erosive soils and uh, and ATV tracks, but the whole WMA is is a spider web of of such activity, and th this is literally like a like a ski resort. If you've gone to one, that there are um, green trails that would be the equivalent of the bunny slopes where the little ATVs go. And then there are these rock walls that would be the, the double black diamond slopes and, and the mogul hills. Uh, the problem being that these soils are so erosive up here that the bunny trail rapidly turns into um, a, a blue and then, and then black. Um, there's one of the things that the media likes to focus on is is an, a feature here called the peanut butter hole which is just on the border of our property um, technically not not on us but it's so close um, it's it's difficult it was part of the attention to this issue came when the peanut butter hole essentially blew out several winters ago sent a cascade of mud down the mountain, took out a state highway, and then deposited itself into the Tennessee River. And we'll, we'll show you some pictures of that. This is a close-up of the peanut butter hole. And, and there's something for everyone here when it comes to ATVs, um, especially when it rains. And the big rock walls off to the left here are, are for the rock crawlers and the smaller vehicles. Uh, Play, or play around on other elements of the, of the peanut butter hole. One of the issues here is that these soils are, are so erosive that all the nutrients have been leached out of them. So doing any type of reclamation up here is, is going to be on the scale of doing mine land reclamation, which we have a great deal, great deal of experience with. But it's, it's difficult because you're at the very top of the mountain here. and. Uh, uh, products such as mulch or, or composted material to amend these soils is going, going to eventually have to be brought up the mountain. Um, you'll see um, these little trails through the trees that will eventually become what you see, what you see on the left. Once, once the very thin layer of topsoil is gone, you soon get down to all these uh, clays and sands. Um, I'll show you this picture because this is Alan Pyburn. He works with Environmental Services. Alan is a very large man sitting on a very large machine on something that started out as a bunny trail about 10 years ago. And just to dem demonstrate how quickly uh, the combination of, of weather and, and use uh, cut through this. An additional um, issue is that is that some of the users are um, like to have more challenges than they think the mountain provides so they'll come up here with heavy equipment and dig out places to play in and um, um, places for ATVs and these these off-road vehicles to try to get through it's a, uh, a as I understand it if you if you tear your equipment up and get off the mountain successfully you just had a wonderful day um, in, in some of these places. Um, you'll, you'll see here just the start of erosion, and this picture doesn't, doesn't do it justice, but uh, where the erosion starts off to the right of this picture here, the slope of the mountain falls away pretty quickly. So what comes off this little area is quickly going to head cut and become a, a large gully going off, off through the forest. Um, 
these pictures are, are a little difficult, but this is the, the blowout of the peanut butter hole, and it shows some of the deltas of mud that have deposited them, themselves out in the Tennessee River Gorge. Um, and, and to top things off while we were down there last time, I found an abandoned coal mine, weep, <laughs> weeping acid mine drainage out. So, so that, was, uh, that was pretty interesting. One, one more thing to deal with down there. Um, just in, in rough terms of what it's going to uh, require to restore this area, just the WMA, which is is probably, I don't know, 40% or less of all of the activity on that mountain when it comes to off-road vehicles. Um, we're looking at, uh, since we're going to have to amend soils, they've taken the high end of what it costs to do mine reclamation. Uh, we've kind of walked out the secondary road network and bringing those roads back to grade and and then cleaning up some of the streams. Since we're at the top of the mountain, all this mud is traversing our neighbors on the way down to the Tennessee River. Uh, so we're looking at a substantial amount of investment over time to, to restore this area. But there's really no sense in, in starting that process until we bring the riding under control. And I think that's part of what we wanted to share with you today is the, the agency has gone through the process of notifying the pub, public that this um, type of activity is just not compatible with our responsibilities for managing the WMA. Uh, we're going about this in a very patient um, process, stepwise process to inform the public and um, John Mayer's folks in Region 3 are, are doing a, a, a fabulous job of law enforcement working with folks and, and beginning, beginning this process. People have been riding up here for the last two decades, so it's it's going to take a little time to bring this under control. And um, as questions about this come your way, and I have no doubt that that uh, that that will happen in the new year, um, please please let us assist you in answering answering questions and providing information as as to where we are in this in this uh, project. Um, the fact of the matter is, is that if this area can be restored and, uh, to uh, use as a beneficial WMA, uh, it, it, it could be a beautiful place and, and uh, could really be an asset to the Hamilton County, Marion County, County area. So with that, I'd greatly appreciate your patience and if I could answer any questions or if John or Steve or, or Ed Thank you. Uh, access into it for us is the, the major issue for enforcement right now, isn't it? That, that's correct. The, the property that was off to the southeast that's owned by um, Black Creek uh, developers, um, they, they have gone, gone through a process where they uh, got the city of Chattanooga to annex all of the mountain that is in Hamilton County. Um, they then got a, a bond issue through the city to build a road up to the top, right up near the boundary of the WMA. And that will, that will solve some of the problems on that side of the mountain because the city of Chattanooga uh, police will be able to uh, enforce trespassing laws over there. And it will give our officers access from that side of the mountain. And, and uh, it's just going to take more patience elsewhere on the mountain. But uh, we had a meeting with the adjacent landowners a week or so ago, and and they were, um, I, I think, consistent in that if we can control the activity on our property, that will allow them to then control the activity on their property. And it may include allowing people to ride in, in, in some cases. Right. Any questions from the commission? Ms. Jane. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We define what controlling the ride means. Does that mean prohibiting the vehicles? Does that mean uh, hours? Does that mean size of vehicle? What, what exactly does that mean? Well, in, in initially, um, use of ATVs and off-road vehicles on, on the WMA will, will be prohibited. Okay. 
we're going to have to bring it under control to start some type of reclamation process. Eventually, um, there may be, uh, there's an issue of whether or not a road um, that goes into Marion County is a, provides public access. We're not sure how that issue is going to be resolved. But uh, for instance, on, on the Catoosa WMA, there are public roads across the WMA where people can, can ride, but they're not allowed to get very far off those roads uh, to travel on the WMA. And that may be what we end up here. But the big off-road vehicles, the big rock crawlers, um, we don't foresee that as ever being part of the WMA process. That sounds very wise. I remember in our orientation they showed pictures of the big rock crawlers. And have any of those individuals to date received a fine or other than the public, we don't want you doing that anymore? To my knowledge on the WMA, what we've been doing to date is, is, is posting and informing the public. Um, I understand from John and some of the officers that met with us in Chattanooga that most of the citations that have been issued up there have not been for riding, but for um, uh, intoxication, underage drinking, uh, other, other type of law enforcement issues. Do you anticipate that fines will be given for those folks who bring the big rock crawlers on if they're prohibited from being on the property? I would, yes, yes. I, I think, think that that would be a really great idea. I think the I short think answer that, is yes. That word will get out really quick too. Thank you very much. Have, 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 has anybody reached out to the local legislators? Because when you start writing tickets for those folks that have done that their whole life, there's going to be a backlash. The answer is yes. There have been, there have been meetings with uh, the local um, county executives and, and mayors and the DAs from both Hamilton and Marion County. There have been some in the General Assembly who have been involved in the uh, helping facilitate the meetings that we've had with the public. Uh, and we went through an extensive process of seeking public input um, on onto activities on the mountain. So I think we've been, have been sensitive to keeping, keeping everyone informed as we go through um, a very patient process here. Has it, has it been closed now to uh, off-road vehicle use, or is that about to happen, or what's the status? Well, the, the signs have been up saying that, that off-road and ATVs are not allowed on the WMA. Um, we are in the, in the process of starting some of the details that will, we hope, turn people away at the, at the, at the boundary, and if necessary, issue warning citations. Um, and, and start to bring this activity under control on the on the wildlife management area. Chairman Brown, uh, I just wanted to compliment uh, Dave and, and John Mayer and and um, Kirk Miles and all their staff for the job they did. I attended that meeting a couple of weeks ago, ten days ago, and and uh, they had given notice to the adjacent landowners. A letter was sent to them and as far as I know all of them attended the meeting and were really uh, very supportive of the action that the agency uh, is taking uh, there was also a very well written uh, public announcement that was distributed to the TV and newspaper media and was all published and that was after I think there was like two or three public meetings may I don't know the exact number but then 60 to 75 days of a period of time where pub public comment was invited so there's been a lot of information put out it obviously it hadn't set well which we knew that it wouldn't but um, it's uh, it's the right the right action to be taken and to preserve that area for the purpose for which it's intended so it's going to be a long slow process as Dave said and and it's going to take a lot 
uh, of effort on the part of the agency and expense too to uh, uh, enforce these regulations. And what, what a lot of people don't know, the public, I mean, this is a regulation that's been in effect from on all WMAs from day one. So it's not something that has just been uh, thought up by the agency. It, it hadn't been enforced. And uh, I guess because of that lack of enforcement or the tolerance on the part of the agency, it's just gotten completely out of hand and very destructive in that area. The way I recall, though, are, are a lot of these people from Georgia that come over into to, to ride? Great number of them. Georgia, Alabama, different different areas. I mean, really, I think from what I've heard, all over the southeast, uh, it it is quite a big affair. And of course, really, what got our agency, uh, for the lack of a better word, involved or taking action, TDEC got on our people and said, you know, when this when this erosion occurred and this mudslide blocked Highway 41 and then went on into the river, uh, that's when attention was paid to it and everybody started getting, getting something done. But all of the, to my knowledge, all of the agencies, the uh, Forest Service, TDEC, uh, Ed will know, all of them met here a couple of months ago or something and there was like 40 or 50 people uh, from different agencies that have interest in this area attended and it was unanimous that this was the action that needs to be taken. So uh, thank you, appreciate the job you all have done. Thank, thank you. Any other questions from the commission? Bill, question? I just, when we discussed this in staff, I was curious as to how vehicles could be so destructive. So I went on the internet to Google and Googled Mount Etna, and I would suggest that maybe if you want to really see these guys in action, that you do the same. It'll take you to YouTube videos. It's just a slew of them and a list on there of all manner of vehicles. Most of them aren't street legal. These are custom rods, if you will made specifically for this purpose so it's really interesting to see how much fun they're having in the, in the process of destroying the mountaintop thank you uh chairman brown that concludes the wildlife committee thank you chairman brown the budget committee recognizes jim hamlington regional wildlife manager Region 1. Uh, on a side note, too, I wanted to mention that when we had meetings out in West Tennessee last month, Jim introduced me to Sweet Lips, Tennessee, and I was really taken with the name, so I just researched it a little bit, and Jim sent me a um, hunting hat with Sweet Lips, Tennessee on it and a T-shirt. So if any of you gentlemen would like to borrow that hunting hat, um, you're more than welcome to. So uh, anyway, thank you, Jim. Uh, Region 1 would like to request a budget expansion for hop-in well and pump. Uh, we had a budget expansion back in August, an improvement project. It was $170,000. Uh, when we got put the bids out, it was $90,000 more than $170,000, about $260,000. So we're a little under, under, under budget, uh, over, overspent or whatever, but we need another $90,000. Uh, if we don't get this expansion and we don't dig the well, then we won't have a uh, refuge at hop in, the waterfowl refuge. All right. Um, any questions from the commission? And oh, what cost? I mean, you got a pretty big gap there. It's like half a year. What, okay. what do you anticipate costs? What, what happened was the, the well collapsed back in June, right. the, the well that was there. Uh, it's a sand blow. There's artesian wells out there in in, in hop in. Uh, we all, we were digging a well at also at Lake Lauderdale Refuge, and we had some estimates at Lake Lauderdale, and Lake Lauderdale was going to have to be about 550 foot, 500 something foot deep, and so we had some estimates on that, and they came up to about 170 thousand dollars, which is what we've got it at 
at Lauderdale for, for the well. And so he thought, well, 550 feet, you know, same difference. Well, uh, Lauderdale came in at about $170,000 when we put the bid out. Hop in because of the artesian wells, and they're trying to dig through the, uh, through the sand, and they don't know where they are. We've got a site picked out. We've got the 404 permits. And when the well diggers hit it, water's coming up, and they have to deal with the water, and they're putting steel casing. And the reason that the cost is so high now, too, is it was the hop in was plastic pipe, uh, plastic casing. And nobody will do go that deep with plastic casing anymore. And that's what, what caused the well to collapse was the plastic casing. So it's got to be steel casing. And that brings the price up more, too. What is the what's what's the nearest refuge to hop in? What's the downside to not having a refuge there? The downside? Yeah, I mean, in there is there another refuge within about main is, five main miles? Manus Swamp is is I think it's ten miles down the river, up the river, excuse me, up Obion River, uh, and it was set with a a series. You've got hop in, Manus Swamp, and then Bean Switch Refuge on up the river. And it does hold uh, a lot of ducks, a lot more ducks than Maine Swamp does, and it holds the sandhill cranes. But we don't have. And if it wasn't a refuge, we could hunt it. Uh, it wouldn't mean water. We could small game hunt it. Well, the artesian wells you said were running water on top of the ground. No, that they're not coming to the top of the oh, ground when they dig. Down. When they dig down, they're, they're not coming down. down. <clears throat> now, if we had if we had a levee up there like where Black Swamp was, uh, and we we had a pond, we could fill the refuge with the, the water from coming out of Black Swamp. Chairman Chester, I make a motion we approve the expansion. Second. All right. Thank you. Uh, Chairman Brown, the Budget Committee and I recommend passage of this proposed budget expansion for Project 1478 in the amount of $90,000. Aye. All right, thank you. The Budget Committee recognizes Director Ed Carter. Thank you, Chairman Schuster. Again, asking you to consider a budget expansion for acquisition of Skinner Mountain Wildlife Management Area. It's actually, uh, as Bill talked about earlier, a cooperative project we've had with the Nature Conservancy for some time. They bought that property back in 2006. Of We've been managing it as a WMA since that time, and over time they have paid some of that down. It, it, this is a huge amount of money, and we did a lot of soul searching on whether or not we thought we could do this and still go forward. It, as it turns out, the way we're looking at it, it would be the budget expansion $1.7 million. It's uh, 4,208 acres. It's uh, in both uh, Fentress and Cumberland counties. It's, oh, excuse me. Uh, Overton, yeah. Uh, it, it's just down from, from the North Cumberland uh, Wildlife Management Area. If you're looking, well, as a matter of fact, I do have a map, don't I? There must be some way to get out of this. If y'all can imagine what this looks like, this is. I can show you this. Let's see if I can get this down. If that helps at all. No, there is a little bit of it, I think, in Overton. The headquarters, so to speak, maybe. But anyway, this is essentially what the, the area looks like. And you know, if the areas I'm just talking about, I need my granddaughter here. This is the area that we're looking at above. These are the areas around it with, with all, the, all the green being some type of public uh, management area or something we're involved in. You have the North Cumberland Wildlife Management Area, have the uh, Catoosa, 
They have Big South Fork, have Alpine Mountain, all those that were already there. This would bring this acquisition into our ownership. The, the praise price for the piece of property is $4.8 million. The Nature Conservancy has been paying on it to the point now that they're, they're offering it to us for $1.7 million. If, if we were doing the entire purchase without the Nature Conservancy, we would have to come up with $1.2 million of match money from somewhere inside the agency. But because of the bargain sale that they're offering, that makes the match. So this would be a 100% federal purchase in terms of agency money. We have, for the last two years, gotten a very large bump from the federal side on our PR money because of gun sales and ammunition in the United States from our letter that we just got from the Fish and Wildlife Service, they tell us that this year should be the largest we've ever seen. I had our federal aid personnel, Barry Sumners, went through this, looked at what it would do long term. We talked about it in staff. There are some other acquisitions that are going on up there, and we thought, well, th will this impact what we're going to do in that area? So long story short, the staff decision is it would be a really good idea to move forward on it, especially at the, at the price that they're offering to us. So it would be a, a budget expansion of $1.7 million for 4,208 acres, all federal aid money, to become a state-owned wildlife management area. Move to approve. Second. Uh, Chairman Brown, the Budget Committee and I recommend that TWA purchase with federal funds in the amount of $1.7 million the Skinner Mountain Track. Is the agency going to have to uh, direct or any other resources that we'll need as far as staffing and, and to manage this area? Do you see any other expenses for us or do we have the staff available to, to manage this property as we are currently staffed? i give you a mixed answer. Okay, great. But we've been managing the property as a wildlife management area through a lease with, with uh, Nature Conservative. Okay. So in that respect, we can go forward with what we have. If we want to do anything more than what we've been doing, uh, we'd have to do some reassessment of where we'd either shift manpower or ask for some type of additional funding. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Um, at this time, I'd also like again to thank Gina and the Nature Conservancy for all that you do in partnering with us and helping us to make these awesome purchases that, that help the, the state overall. It's, it's very important in the days to come, and I appreciate it, as well as the rest of the commission. Thank you. And Gina, we will get that float trip in. We will. It'll be a great trip. Thank you. The Budget Committee recognizes Gordon Martin, Real Estate Specialist, Engineering Division. Thank you, Chairperson Shilster and Commissioner. Uh, what I'd like to do is to update your real estate report from uh, the one that you have in your notebook, the changes since, since the notebook was published. Uh, in Campbell County, uh, we are uh, working on a utility, an easement to the La Follette Utility Board for 911 service improvement. Uh, this has passed the Building Commission and there's appraisal in progress uh, to determine the fair market value of that. In Chester County, uh, we have a wetland acquisition. We're partnering with the Tennessee Parks and Greenways for 300 acres. Uh, this is, uh, has an appraisal bid that is currently being bid. Uh, in well, we have uh, nine tracks uh, in Fayette County and one track in Shelby County uh, in the Wolf River area where the, we are uh, finishing up with environmental assessments. They have been completed on those acquisitions. Uh, in Hamlin County, the Morristown Fish Hatchery, 15 acres. Uh, we have funds transferred for closing. This transaction should close within the next 15 days or so. In Jackson County, we're partnering with Tennessee Parks and Greenway again. Uh, uh, this is, uh, has an appraisal in progress. Uh, down in Morgan County, we have a gift from a Mr. Reister of 47.5 acres. Uh, we are 
currently de the deed is in prep for that and the closing should be within the next week or so. And that's all I have for you today. If uh, you have questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Any questions? Further questions? All right. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it, Gordon. All right, the Budget Committee recognizes Ken Tarkington, Chief of Administrative Services. Thank you, Commissioner Schuster. Uh, I apologize, I have no slides. I have no video. I have no money. I have one piece of paper, and it is front and back, though, in your, in your book. Um, and I am reporting on the financial condition of the, um, of the four funds through the month of October. And at the top of the page, the boating fund, as your report shows, the one I put in your book, is almost 35% less than where we were this time last year. And as you recall, several months ago when we talked, uh, this is how Finance and Administration records our deposits. Uh, we also trend our sales, and uh, which I think is much more uh, important as to the health of what we're doing. And the amount of sales of boat registrations actually are 8.2% less than the prior year during that same point in time. Um, in like manner, if you were to look at the wildlife fund, <clears throat> middle of the page, the report you have there shows that we're 6.2% above projection or above last year, when in actuality we're 7.5% less. Now these, what I'm uh, telling you or what I'm reporting on from, from what I'm looking at on the trend is when those sales occur. So uh, we're down in wildlife uh, license sales, we're down in boating registration. I still don't think it's time for any concern. Uh, it, may, it may end up that way at the end of the year, but our biggest season is, as y'all, uh, I think, uh, are aware, is in the spring uh, of the year, both for uh, 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 boating and wildlife together. Uh, on the boating side, the expenditures were at about 24% of our allotment. We've spent about 24% of our allotment uh, for the fiscal year. And on the wildlife side of expenditures, we're at approximately 26%. So we're fairly well on target with that. Uh, at the bottom of the page, the endowment funds, the watchable wildlife, we have about $28,000 available uh, for those programs. And the lifetime uh, sportsmen, uh, there is a fund balance of a little over $33 million in that fund. On the second, or on the back of your page, uh, at the top, the Wetlands Acquisition Fund has approximately 8.3 million um, uh, to date through October. The maintenance we have zeroed out, as we usually do, and the compensation, which is the in lieu of tax, uh, has approximately 373,000 balance in it through October. <clears throat> Any questions or comments? All right. Thank you, Ken. Thank you. Great job. Thank you, Chairman Brown. That completes all business concerning the Budget Committee. Is there any uh, other business, new business, to come before the Commission at this time, Director Carter? Yes, sir. I, I don't know how close you were to adjourning. I just wanted to let you know we, we do need to nail down a January date for the right. meeting because we have some rules that need to be filed. So uh, in a February date, too, if that's possible. When we first talked about meeting dates, it was the 23rd and 24th. And if you'll note, that's a Wednesday and Thursday. The idea being that you're going up for confirmation before the legislature. And we don't know exactly when that's going to be. But guessing that the committees would, would probably be meeting on Wednesday. We, that's the reason we're going for a Wednesday, Thursday. Uh, it's, 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 a, it's a guess, so it's strictly up to you all. The one that we looked at most recently was January the 30th, which would be more realistic of when the legislature comes back into, into session and actually begins their work there. I'll stop and ask Nat if that's still our best guess. On Jen meeting would not meet on a Thursday. So 
So it would either, it would either meet on Tuesday or Wednesday. But they have not set it on either side, have not set a schedule yet for committee meetings. But I know it will not be on Thursday. That doesn't preclude the, the commission from meeting on Thursday. But if you want to set the date for the two days, it would be more than likely it would be Tuesday and Wednesday. Right now, the House is planning on, the, the, on the House side, planning on having those, those confirmation hearings on the 22nd or 23rd. And the date has not been finalized. Um, so, Mr. Usually the second Tuesday is when the General Assembly goes in session. Tradition is in a new General Assembly, they're out for two weeks. Are they not going to take their two weeks? Because that would have them, and last two years ago they took three weeks. Have they decided not to take the full three? Do you? I think there's some, still some discussion going on. The House plans, plans right now, my understanding is two weeks. The Senate has not decided what they're going to do as of yesterday. That's my information out there. Right. So if they take their two weeks, which I don't recall a time in the last 30 years when they haven't, they won't be in that week. So it seems like the 22nd or the 23rd would not be good dates if we're trying to coordinate with the confirmation because they won't be in session. Just remind you what we're doing is you have a calendar tab there if you want to look at the calendars in your book. Mr. Chairman, I have a suggestion. Okay. I, 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 this is going to be up in the air. It's going to be up in the air. We're trying to set it as, as quick as possible. There's all we're doing. If we go to that next week, uh, we're taking about seven days off our 60 days. But tentatively, if, if you want to get more positive on a tentative date, I, I, I would say take the 29th. And 30. But I, I, I can't I can't guarantee any of those at this point right. in time. Right. And which would be impossible to confirm it because they don't have their schedules. So y'all y'all would never be able to confirm that positively. I've got a suggestion. Sure. We you and I discussed if we're gonna to try to have our February meeting in conjunction with yeah. what's going on. Yeah. Right. That we set that one and back it up 30 days and have it in the ones of us who have to be confirmed when the, when the time comes, we just have to make a trip to Nashville. And, well, we'll just have to all come back because we can't make a we can't plan on what the legislature is going to do when they don't know. I don't know how we're going to do that. And you can't set a meeting two weeks from me from, from with two weeks. How much advance notice are we going to get? That they're going to do it at least four. They don't. They don't actually have to decide until January the 8th. They don't have to decide. And what I was getting from the House yesterday, that they're really going to be a little bit slow in what they're going to do. They're not going to announce committee or, or committee chairman or anything until after that date. They're not going to allow bill pre-filing until after that date. What date was that, Dan? On the 8th. It will be the first day they'll come back and have their organizational week. That <coughs> week. And if I can state the obvious of the the legislature could push it to 60 days. Sure. I mean, they don't have to do it at all, but assuming they stay within the 60 days, it may not even be in January or even early February. So that's, that's another possibility. And it, just as Commissioner Cox said, we, we don't have to set the meeting for that purpose. We were just trying to keep you from having to make another trip, but not knowing when that's going to be throws a, a real kink in it. Yeah, and, and just generally, the calendars will come out the week before. It's not horribly convenient, and I'm sure that, that Nat and the, the clerk's offices will work with us as much as they can, but Thursday afternoon, the week before, is the latest we would know. It, 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 it's a possibility, it, as we talked yesterday, that it could be as late as the 10th before we would know what the actual calendar was going to be when they would come out <clears throat> on what day the those committees would be. And what we're trying to do is, is as soon as possible be in the first week that they have committee meeting the commitments on both sides to do that but we just don't I just truly don't know which week it's going to be or whether it's going to be on a tuesday or a tuesday or a wednesday but it'll be a tuesday or a wednesday 
not be on the first. What, what's the date of the NWTF uh, convention? 14th through the 16th or 17th, I think. I, I believe. Is that right, Mike Butler? February. It's that weekend. Yeah. Go ahead and set the February meeting for the 14th and 15th and then back up a month. We don't want to have a meeting within two weeks of each other. That, that and just for the way, it, it, we're looking at the proposed agenda that, that we've been working on. It could be a one-day meeting in January as well, so that's another consideration. Well, what about, I thought you said there may be a rulemaking or? A, there will be. Okay. Well, it, but you, that still gives you enough time from now if we met. Uh, 17th and 18th of January yes, okay as long as we have those dates set aside then if it turns out to be a one day meeting there's no problem we can let everybody know the main thing is to have that those dates on on your agenda to be here uh, okay. we do have to file the rule for a specific day so we'll probably file it for the second day of the meeting if yeah they okay all right then let's let's say the meeting in january will be uh thursday and friday the 17th and 18th with the possibility it'll only be a one-day meeting on the 18th and then the meeting in february will be thursday and friday the 14th and 15th realize that's valentine's well you had me there you had me up here on my 50th anniversary, so I don't think Valentine's <laughs> Day. I'll take my chances. And then they'll just let us know if we're going to come another day for Yeah, yeah. Nat, you all are, you'll let us know as soon as you know if we're coming another day for confirmation. Absolutely. Yeah. I'll try to keep you updated anything I hear about what it's going to be. You know, the commission does not actually have to convene. Right. For a meeting. We did it to the president for the two committee meetings. Exactly. It, it was, I think, just trying to be a convenience for everybody to be in, in town, yeah. you know, at that time. But, no, we won't. Uh, I knew we didn't have to convene at all. Yeah, just one or two real quick other things. In terms of the January meeting, we talked about the off-road vehicle thing in, on Etna Mountain. I met with, with a representative from the off-road vehicle community uh, this week. They've requested to come before the, the commission in January, not specifically talk about Etna Mountain, but about an off-highway vehicle program in general in Tennessee. That's been addressed by the commission in years past. The state law does give that program to, the, to this agency, and we obviously have done some things. They want to come and meet with you so I've tentatively told them that would okay when I would get back to them when the meeting was actually going to take place but just wanted you to know that because there is a lot of chatter on the internet right now I uh, also want you to be aware of the news release if you haven't seen it about illegal movement of, of wild hogs uh, we had a court case that our that our special investigations unit or, or covert people would put together there was an arrest made uh, for a person who's illegally moving hogs and buying them and selling them and uh, got a pretty good court case out of that around five thousand dollars in, in violations and fines uh, some probation and, and a couple other things uh, turned out to be a person in the veterinary services and who uh, was was convicted of that when it led to another case as well so it just confirmed some of the things that we've been saying over the last couple of years that we knew that was going on so it would complement our our guys for doing that just wanted wanted you to know about it because it is in the news media and it's been picked up in a couple of places and then, where was that uh out of lincoln county is that right it was lincoln wasn't it 
One last thing, uh, some guy named Nat Johnson has decided to retire. <laughs> uh, I'm not going to say a whole lot about that until, the, until January because Nat has, can, has said that he would retire around January the 15th, and he's going to stay on part-time with us to help us through this next legislative session. Uh, I begged and pleaded, and I guess he felt sorry for me, so he decided that he would do that. Uh, we owe Nat a great deal of thanks over a lot of things over the last several years, but I'll, I'll just leave it at that for right now unless there's something you want to say, Nat. <laughs> well, and I know probably some of y'all won't have some comments too, but not not pushing him off for making light, but he'll still be here in January, and we're going to Shanghai him back over here, and that would be appropriate time, I think, to say a few things. Other than that, that's all I have, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Nat, you'd better be thinking about it because you're going to get called on in January, so be working up your speech. I'll try to make it short. Your acceptance <laughs> speech. Uh, okay, if there's nothing further uh, before the come to come before the commission at this time, I want to remind the commission that we're going into executive session after this meeting to meet with uh, our attorney from the Attorney General's office. That, of course, is a closed meeting, and uh, that will take place up on the hill. Is that right, Director Carter? Okay, at the offices on the hill. If there's nothing further, wish everybody a Merry Christmas and a happy and healthy New Year and safe travel. Thank you. We're adjourned. We have lunch up there. Okay.